touch on um, works done with sort of a, a, a bunch of people um, who are listed down here. So thanks to all my collaborators who contributed to, to what I'm gonna tell you about today. Um, and I wanted to start by, so, you know, since this is more of a high energy audience, I wanted to start by kind of putting in context the, the big question. So one of the questions that we like to think about in condensed matter is basically sort of understanding what are the possible phases of, of matter. And so for the purposes of this talk, I'm gonna specifically talk about phases at, at, at zero temperature, so quantum phases. Um, so what does that mean? Well, we're, you know, we're talking about a single sort of Hilbert space. So we think about, you know, models which have the same Hilbert space, the same kinds of interactions. Um, but, you know, maybe we're gonna tune some parameter so that we're gonna change the Hamiltonian. And what we're gonna see as we do that is that the system um, can have actually quite dramatically different physical properties. Um, so, you know, for example, maybe I have a magnetic system here, it's on a honeycomb lattice. And maybe, you know, as I tune the, the some parameter in the Hamiltonian, doesn't really matter what it, what, what it is, I go from um, a, a pattern, you know, the, a, a, a ground state, okay, a zero temperature phase, where the spins are sort of lined up in regular patterns. This doesn't have a net magnetic moment, right? But you can see that along this strip here, the spins are pointing left. And then, you know, these, these purple guys are pointing right. And we have this regular ordered pattern throughout the sample. And then maybe I, I, I sort of tune some parameter of the Hamiltonian. Um, and at some point, uh, uh, I look at the system again, and it has this quite dramatic behavior where I see no ordering whatsoever um, in, in these spins, if I look for a sort of static order. Um, and we say that, okay, so, so we can see these quite dramatically different physical behaviors, and we say that these are different phases when they're separated by a phase transition, okay? So, so when you have to go through some kind of thermodynamic singularity, okay? Um, and just to sort of clarify, um, there's an instructive um, example of of what this means more specifically in the phase diagram of, of, of water. Okay, so this is now pressure and temperature. Um, but basically, if you look at water, so we, we all think of water as having three phases. You know, we learned this in high school, like the solid phase, the liquid phase, and the gas phase. And if we sit here at room temperature, we see two phase transitions, right? So you start with your block of ice, it melts, and then it's a puddle, you know, in the, and then you, you know, collect that water and you stick it on the stove and you see a second phase transition that boils off, okay? But now if we look at sort of the global phase diagram here, if we're allowed to change the pressure, we see that the solid phase is always um, distinct from the, the, the liquid phase or the, the liquid phase or the gas phase. So there's always a phase transition there. However, if you go to higher pressures, you can actually get between the liquid phase and the gas phase without going through a phase transition, okay? And so when I say two, two things are in different phases, I really mean, you know, like the solid and this liquid gas phase, okay? That you have to go through a phase transition. There's no way to get between the two. Now, um, one of the, and so, so we can ask, well, when do we know that things have to be in different phases? Um, and there's sort of a conventional approach to this or paradigm for this known as the Landau paradigm, okay? And um, we can use that to explain what we're seeing in the phase diagram of water. So the Landau paradigm basically says the following, ice is a crystal, okay? So these atoms have picked out rather specific locations in space and there's a long, some long ranged order going on here. And so we have a, a symmetry that's broken, in this case, translational symmetry, and that's the crystalline phase, okay? Um, and this symmetry is spontaneously broken exactly, you know, as you would think about if you thought about like the Higgs mechanism and high energy physics. Whereas in the liquid and gaseous phase, there is no long range positional order to these atoms, okay? So this translation symmetry is unbroken. And um, because these two don't, are not different in their symmetry properties, um, they're not actually distinct phases. And we can see in fact, that there's a way to get between them um, without, without going through a phase transition. And so this is sort of the conventional picture that different phases of matter, um, at least in as much as we can tell them apart by their symmetries, um, you know, they're different because they have this, you know, they go through this spontaneous symmetry breaking transition. Okay. Um, and so that's sort of, I would say the 20th century paradigm. Now there's a second possibility, um, which people started to think about in the 21st, uh, century, okay, 
which is what we call symmetry protected topological uh, phases of matter. And so if you've heard of topological insulators or topological superconductors, um, maybe you've heard of higher order topological insulators, all of the, these sort of fall into this uh, more modern paradigm. And so here, um, I have two phases, they have the same symmetry and the symmetry is, is unbroken in both phases. And so kind of locally in the bulk, this is liquid phase number one, this is liquid phase number two. And again, if I look locally in the bulk, they look exactly the same. Okay. So how do we know that these are different phases? What tells them apart? Um, <clears throat> And so let me say just, just a little bit about their physical properties. Okay, so again, the bulk, the bulk looks boring. The bulk, and, and by boring, I mean, you know, locally the bulk looks the same as some other phase that we think is boring. Okay. But if you look at the surfaces of these systems, these symmetry protected topological systems, um, there we see something that's quite interesting. Um, and so, for example, if you've heard of the topological insulator, and the first example that I'm going to discuss in some detail is the three-dimensional topological insulator, what, what we find is that on the surface of, of our system, we get these interesting conducting surface states, okay? Conducting means that they're gapless, okay? We can't open a mass gap. Um, and, they're, and they're robust. So, you know, normally if I add disorder, for example, to a system, I'm going to... Um, open a mass gap, it's gonna stop conducting, but these ones actually are quite robust to those kinds of perturbations, okay? And so what is this surface state? Well, in the absence of disorder, it looks like this single or more generally odd number of Dirac cones, okay? Um, and this robustness, by the way, depends on the material having an unbroken time reversal symmetry. Um, and you can sort of see in this cartoon that here's a sort of perturbative picture of how this robustness comes about is that time reversal symmetry basically forbids um, direct backscattering between um, particles of opposite spin um, and the Dirac cone sort of locks the, the, um, the spin and the momentum. And so this is a forbidden process. And, um, you know, just to emphasize, you know, one of the things that I love about condensed matter physics is that this, these are real materials, okay? So this is, um, uh, uh, and actually somehow the, the paper reference didn't make it across to the slide, but so this is this is an experimental uh, uh, image using angle resolved photo emission spe spectroscopy um, from a paper by David Shea when he was working in Zahid Hassan's lab at Princeton. And, and here we can see, okay, so what these lines are, are actually showing you this Dirac cone. This is sort of a cut in momentum space across here, and we can see this Dirac cone. And then up here, we see some um, states associated with the bulk. Okay, so we now have many materials that actually exhibit these surface states. Um, so, so what's going on here? Um, well, the symmetry that, that is relevant to this system is just charge conservation, okay, U1 charge conservation, and time reversal symmetry, okay? And what, what I said was that on this surface, okay, this, in this case, the special surface state is that we see an odd number of Dirac cones. Okay. And you and you and and you might ask, well, what's what's unusual about the bulk? If I'm talking about this as a phase of you know a three-dimensional insulator, the bulk must somehow be different from um, you know another time reversal invariant three-dimensional insulator. And um, indeed, it it's locally it's not different, but but globally it is. And I'm not gonna. So there's some very beautiful theory about these topological insulators, and I've wrote down you know, worked out by a bunch of people um, over the years, kind of from 2006 to about 2010. Um, um, so I haven't listed all the papers, but I've, I've listed um, the, the people who kind of made these primary early contributions. Um, but, you know, the basic idea, if you know about sort of um, band structures a little bit, uh, basically, you know, when we look at the, the single particle states of the electrons in this system, um, their momentum eigenstates, but momentum on a lattice is periodic, okay? And so there is a sort of topological invariant associated with the winding of the phase of these single particle eigenstates as you take them around this periodic direction of momentum. And so here's a cartoon of what that looks like in one dimension. So here's the circle here is momentum space. 
And then these lines are meant to represent kind of a, a vector showing the direction of the phase of your wave function. And you can see that in the trivial case, that phase doesn't wind, but you could imagine it winding um, as you go around this periodic momentum direction. And this would be, you know, roughly speaking, uh, the right picture to have in your head when you think about a topological insulator. Good. And Okay, so this is sort of what we observe. We observe that the bulk has this non-trivial topology. That's where the name topological insulator comes from. Um, and we observe these unusual surface states. But we might ask, you know, okay, so, so why at a, at a sort of deeper level, why are these boundaries protected, right? And so you might think, well, you know, for example, couldn't I just take a two-dimensional system with another Dirac cone. So those of you who've, you know, kind of worked with the Dirac equation in two plus one dimensions, you're probably familiar with the fact that if I open up a mass gap for a two dimensional, two, uh, two spatial dimensional Dirac cone, that does break time reversal symmetry. But of course, if I added another Dirac cone, um, then I can, um, I can write down a mass for this pair of Dirac cones that is time reversal invariant. And so then, if I could add this two-dimensional surface state, there would be no problem opening up a mass gap um, and getting back to a surface which would be indistinguishable from the surface of an ordinary kind of boring insulator. And so what's special about this topological insulator is in fact the fact that you can't have a two-dimensional system which has uh, an odd number of Dirac cones and also time reversal symmetry. Okay, so, um, so this odd number of Dirac cones with time reversal symmetry and charge conservation is something that can't exist in two dimensions. Um, it can exist at the boundary of a three-dimensional system. And of course, this is sort of familiar probably for, for anybody who's, um, you know, worked in kind of the lattice QCD uh, 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 community, you know, this is a way to generate like chiral fermions. Um, in odd space time dimension is to put them at the boundary of a higher dimensional lattice. Okay. And so what's going on here? So, so, you know, when we say this, this can't exist in two plus one dimensions, what I mean is there's an anomaly. And so let's look a little bit more carefully at what's going on here. Okay. So um, we can start with the bulk and we can ask, um, you know, of course we have this beautiful topological description of the, of the bulk. Um, but we can also ask if we just, um, you know, look at these bulk bands, we can ask what is the electromagnetic response, okay? Meaning that we're, we don't, our gauge fields are not dynamical, okay? We're just asking if we apply classical background gauge fields, what is the response, um, you know, what action describes the response to those gauge fields? And the answer is that um, the action you should write down is this theta E dot B, okay? So it's our theta F wedge F um, type term here. Okay, and as many of you probably know, these theta terms um, in the in the bulk, where if theta is constant, okay, so th theta in this case, sorry, I should say, um, because we have time reversal symmetry, um, theta is periodic modulo two pi, and the only allowed values of theta are zero and pi if we impose time reversal symmetry. So in this case, theta is quantized, and for our topological insulator, theta is pi in the bulk and in the vacuum, so outside of the system, theta is zero, okay? So this action is a total derivative unless we have magnetic monopoles in our system, um, which we don't in condensed matter systems. Uh, uh, and so, so, you know, it tells us that the bulk response is very trivial, but on the boundary, it adds something interesting. So on the boundary, if I integrate by parts, what I get is a Chern-Simons theory with a half integer coefficient, okay? Um, and, so a half integer coefficient for Chern Simons theory, again, you know, in a purely two-dimensional system um, is, is, is not really allowed. Um, but on the boundary of, of so, 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 you know, again, kind of, so basically the bulk is contributing something that we also can't have in two dimensions, okay? And when we combine that sort of bulk theory with this boundary Dirac cone, we actually can get a surface which is time reversal invariant, okay? 
And so the, the, the moral here is, can be summarized as follows, that what we learn from the story of the three-dimensional topological insulator is that we have this boring bulk, but these interesting symmetry protected gapless boundary modes. And what does it mean that they're symmetry protected? It means that this, this what lives on this boundary, if you put it in two dimensions alone, it would have an anomaly, a Tohoft anomaly, okay? Um, and at the same time, the bulk theory has some kind of response theory, a topological response, okay, um, which, you know, makes the bulk into sort of sort of a boring ins insulator, but it contributes something to this boundary, which effectively cancels this anomaly. So when we put these two things together, they're compatible with the symmetry, time reversal symmetry. Okay, and I should say this anomaly was discussed, um, you know, some time ago in the in the high energy literature. So um, kind of well known, but in the content context of condensed matter, it wasn't until we, uh, you know, sort of discovered these materials that people really started thinking about this. Okay, so then we can ask, um, so you know, sort of ar armed with this picture, you can ask a much more general question which is what other um, you know, symmetry protected phases can we think about? And so one way to address that question is you can think about you know, other kinds of anomalies that, that, you, that you know about. Um, and in general, there's sort of two classes of these. So, so the kind that's relevant for the topological insulator, this, this anomaly um, is often called the parity anomaly of QED in, in, in three space time dimensions. This is an example of an anomaly that, that you see only when you look at sort of large gauge transformations. So gauge transformations where the gauge parameter winds in some way on the space-time manifold. And so in, in our case with U1 gauge fields, you have to sort of think about what happens on, 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 a, on a spatial torus. Um, a second kind, um, and so, so, so and, and we can see, we saw, right, an example of how we sort of cancel that anomaly using this bulk theory. Um, a second kind of anomaly, which is maybe more familiar, is a perturbative anomaly, okay, um, which is to say, you know, you have some anomaly under sort of local or small gauge transformations. Um, and that can be canceled as well by a bulk mechanism, and this has sort of been known for a long time and under the name of anomaly inflow. Okay. And so let me talk about one other type of anomaly um, in for ordinary sym symmetries that's probably familiar that is that illustrates this kind of anomaly inflow me mechanism. Um, so an anomaly that that I'm sure most of you are familiar with is the axial or chiral. Yeah, is there a question? Oh, I think I'm getting an echo. Okay, the axial or chiral anomaly. Um, and so let's consider a one dimensional system with the following action, okay, dt phi squared minus dx phi squared, where phi is, phi is a boson, okay? Um, now I could think of this as a condensed matter person, it's natural to think of this as the effective field theory describing some kind of one dimensional um, metallic system, okay? Um, where I have, so, you know, really underlying this is some theory of fermions, but now I've bosonized my fermions, okay? Um, and, and I write down this action and um, I, what I have, what this describes is a, a branch of right moving fermions and a branch of left moving fermions. And you know, when we think about a one dimensional metal, these are typically separated in momentum space. Okay. Um, and so if we look at this action um, and we look at this picture here, there are two classically conserved sort of densities, if you will, the charge density, which is basically the number of right moving particles plus the number of left moving particles, okay? And the momentum density actually, which is, um, so we have a particular value of momentum here at the Fermi C, which we call KF, I should have put that on here, okay? But basically the momentum density depends on the difference between the number of right movers and number of left movers, okay? And so associated with these two conserved quantities are two conserved currents, two classically conserved currents. There's an electromagnetic current, okay, which has J0 is dx phi and Jx is dt phi, right? And you can see that this current is necessarily conserved just by the equality of, of these mixed part, um, you know, the dt dx um, minus dx dt of phi is always zero, okay? On the other hand, there's a second current, 
um, which I'll call the axial current, right, which has J0 being dt phi and Jx being dx phi. And this current is conserved basically because of the equations of motion. Okay. Um, so these, uh, this argument, by the way, is due to, due, due to Eduardo. Um, and I think it's in his, his book. Um, so, but now we can ask, well, what happens if I apply a background electric field? Okay. Um, and so now I'm gonna um, sort of couple these currents again to a classical background field, and that's you, gonna modify. You know, it's actually due to Holger Nielsen. That's where I took it from. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Um, thank you. Um, okay, I think I, I think I read it in your book, which is uh, probably why the, the misattribution there. So um, so you so this modifies the equations of motion, right? And we can see that this second current, this axial axial current in the presence of an electric field, is not conserved. Now, when we think about our one-dimensional metal, this tells us something very intuitive, which is that when we apply an electric field, okay, so this line here, um, this horizontal line is representing the, the Fermi C, okay? And basically when we apply an electric field, what happens is we basically are moving some particles um, sort of to the right. So effectively that we, we, we sort of tilt this potential, okay? And so what's happening is that these, you know, these left moving particles are being pushed over here by the electric field. And indeed, the number of um, right movers minus left movers is not conserved, and that's um, um, sort of not not surprising when you when you think of a, about this as a one dimensional metal. Okay, good. Um, however, I could. Okay, so so I, I I might think of these. You know, I I could. I don't have to think of this um, right mover minus left mover as as a momentum. And um, I could just think of those as two conserved currents. Um, and if I wanted to do that, I would notice that um, in, in one spatial dimension, that system has, that theory has an anomaly and I can't gauge it, but I, I could put it at the boundary of a two-dimensional system, okay? And more specifically, um, so I can write this mutual turn simons theory, okay? And this mutual churn simons theory, if you perform, so I didn't write the gauge transformations for the fields here, but what you'll find is that this um, is gauge invariant only up to a boundary term, okay? And this boundary non-invariance of this action actually can exactly cancel the, um, the boundary variation um, of, the, of, the, uh, of, the, of the boundary action, okay, under this, uh, under this axial gauge field. And so again, so this is kind of a classic example of anomaly inflow, okay, where we have non-invariance under local gauge transformations. Um, and this theory, which is anomalous as a one-dimensional theory is fine at the boundary of a two-dimensional system. Now in condensed matter, we don't usually think of this particular example as, as a symmetry protected topological phase, simply because there's not a natural choice for, if these are two you know, U1 gauge fields, there's not a natural choice for this second U1 gauge field. Um, we could have said charge and spin, but normally spin conservation is not a fundamental sort of symmetry in most materials. Um, but there is a very striking um, example uh, uh, which uh, of, of this kind of physics, which happens if I take actually uh, a theory of only right movers. So if I take a theory of only right movers and I just ask about U1 charge conservation, okay, this symmetry is anomalous, you know, basically because um, this is, um, you know, right movers are are are, um, uh, are 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 sort of charged under both the both the electromagnetic and the axial fields. And when I try to gauge this, I just can't gauge that U1 symmetry in a consistent way. So this is completely forbidden as as a theory in one spatial dimension, um, but we see it experimentally at the boundary of uh, what we call a quantum Hall system, okay? Which happens when I take a sort of two-dimensional gas of electrons and stick it in a high magnetic field, okay? Um, and so this is called the, the quantum Hall effect because if you look at the, um, if you, so basically you, if you apply an electric field, you get no conductance parallel to the electric field. But um, if you look at the current that flows sort of uh, perpendicular to the electric field, okay, you find that that this conductance is is quantized. Okay, the resistivity is quantized, and you see these plateaus at at, um, at integer values, for example. 
Okay. Um, and so this is a sort of striking example of this phenomenon of anomaly inflow um, just in a, in a sort of real material system. Okay, so, so the, the effective electromagnetic response, if I want to um, describe a, uh, you know, a current that's gonna flow perpendicular to the electromagnetic fields turn, turns out to be that I should write down a churn simons term for the bulk, okay? And we know that this churn simons term is gauge invariant only up to a boundary term, okay? And so this has a, you know, the, the bulk has an anomaly at the boundary and that anomaly is exactly canceled by this chiral boson. Um, so the moral of this story is that there's a whole category of phases of matter that we can start thinking about when we think about, you know, anomalies or the possible anomalies in some d-dimensional system, right, and how those might be canceled by some d plus one dimensional bulk, okay? And I've told you about a couple of examples, um, examples involving free fermions, but there are many, many other examples that people have thought about. Um, including examples in strongly interacting systems of bosons, um, as well as strongly interacting systems of fermions. And by this point, we have a fairly um, sort of complete picture of what these phases are, as well as you know, what, the, what the sort of associated anomalies can be um, in, in many of these cases. Okay, so this is a very useful perspective. Okay, and so, yeah, so just to recap, you know, this is a, a new way of thinking about how phases of matter can be different based on symmetry, right? So locally, they look exactly the same. There's no spontaneously broken um, symmetry, but they're not adiabatically connected to each other, okay? Um, and they're not adiabatically connected to each other basically because the bulk has to cancel this boundary anomaly, okay? And for that reason, you know, because the, the bulk um, has this anomaly at the boundary, these boundary modes, right, which they can't be gapped, right, because we need to have this anomaly cancellation, okay? And so unless you break the symmetry so that we no longer um, worry about this, this anomaly, we get some kind of protected gapless uh, behavior that can lead to interesting phenomena such as quantized transport. Um, and so that's kind of the basic picture. Are there questions at, at this point? No, okay. All right, so, so now for the rest of the talk, I want to um, talk about symmetry protected phases, um, what I'm gonna call beyond conventional global symmetries, okay? Um, so what do I mean by beyond conventional global symmetries? Well. Suppose that I want to stick to, you know, a U1 symmetry. What can I impose that's um, stronger than U1 charge conservation? The next sort of most obvious thing to impose would be to impose that a system has dipole moment conservation, okay? Um, and more generally, you could even impose sort of higher multiple moment conservation. And so, you know, sort of cartoon picture of this is that you have a theory and you have, you know, maybe you have just these elementary dipoles and they can slide around or, you know, maybe they can sort of, they can, um, uh, you know, stretch, but kind of in tandem with other dipoles shrinking, etc. Okay. And actually what I'm, so, so this is kind of the obvious next step if you want to think about sort of stronger symmetries. Um, and I'm also going to spend quite a bit of time talking about what we call subsystem symmetry which is basically in a way that I'll explain in more detail in a minute, a sort of stronger version of dipole moment conservation. Okay. Now, why might it be interesting to think about these sort of stronger, in some sense, symmetries? Well, um, we already have some, you know, um, some years back already, some hints um, just from thinking about, again, the topology of bands. So again, this kind of, this kind of free electron picture with sort of topological invariance of these band structures um, that was the first way that people understood topological insulators. Okay. Um, and so the, um, the statement is as follows, and this was um, first sort of discovered in, in, in a paper by Ben Alcazar, Bernervig, and Hughes. Um, 
which is that suppose that I have a filled band and and um, its its dipole moment is fixed, and in fact, its total dipole moment is zero. So in that case, this band, okay, so this sort of set of um, momentum eigen, single particle sort of momentum eigenstates that the electrons can can occupy in my material can have a, a quantized quadrupole moment, um, provided that certain sort of lattice symmetries, so discrete spatial symmetries, um, such as reflections or rotations, are, are respected. Okay. And so this quantization of the quadrupole moment is actually associated with new kinds of topological invariants of the band structure um, and can lead to a sort of different kind of gapless um, boundary state. So in the 3D topological insulator, this orange is sort of where you have conducting stuff, okay? And the, the ordinary 3D topological insulator would have conducting surfaces everywhere, okay? But when we look at um, something with these higher order topological insulators, okay, if the quadrupole moment is quantized, instead of having surfaces um, that are conducting, we can have conducting stuff uh, along kind of the, if you like, the boundary of a boundary. So these, we call them hinges separating different faces of the cube. Okay, and when the octopole moment is quantized, you can actually have these um, just sort of little zero energy bound states at the corners of the cube, okay. So basically um, from thinking about band insulators, okay, band topology, there's a compelling reason to believe that there is something interesting about thinking about um, conservation laws that are stronger than these ordinary global symmetries that are familiar. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, what we'd like to know about these systems is, you know, what's the kind of anomaly associated or what's the anomaly inflow picture? And, you know, ultimately one might, one might like to have a full classification of these kinds of anomalies. Now we'll not get there, but, but, I'll, but I'll show you um, some examples of how to, how to think about these kinds of systems. Okay, so here's the plan. So, so first I'm gonna talk about um, this stronger than dipole conservation symmetry called subsystem symmetry. Um, and I'll tell you about a couple of kinds of anomalies that occur in these theories, okay? And then um, I'll tell you about a couple of sort of amusing connections for each of these examples that I'll tell you about, um, back to things that sort of resemble higher order topological insulators in one case or in the other case, uh, sort of different kind of physical system that, that again, we, you know, is relevant to sort of real experiments. Okay. So, um, what is subsystem symmetry? Let me start by explaining that. So the idea of, so the key word here is subsystem, okay? So this is a global symmetry, but it's a global symmetry where I can act with the symmetry operator on some subset of the sites of the lattice all at once. So um, the examples that I'm gonna be talking about today primarily focus on the ability to act on say lines in a square lattice. Um, <clears throat> And so that means that I could, you know, if I have a U1 symmetry, which rotates the, the, the phase of, um, of some sort of field, uh, then I can perform that phase rotation. So remember a, an ordinary global symmetry, I would rotate the phase of all of the, you know, sort of sites at once, all of the points in, in, my, in my spatial lattice. Um, with the subsystem symmetry, I will rotate the phase of all of the um, sites along, say, this line, and that can be carried out independently of the rotation along this line. You know, for example. Now, more generally, so so you know, here I'm going to start talking about lines. More generally, we could think about um, subsystems that act along planes, or even along more complicated sort of symmetries that act along planes, or even more complicated sort of subsystems such as fractals. Okay. And so how is this related to dipole conservation? Well, basically what the subsystem symmetry requires is that the total charge along each of these lines is conserved. And so that means that an individual charge in, this, in these systems cannot be mobile, okay? Because charge is conserved on each line. So charges can't move. But um, if I take um, a dipole, so this would be a positive charge and this would be a negative charge, I can move it, but um, in this case where the subsystems are lines, I can only move it perpendicular to the, to the direction of the separation between the charges. Okay. 
And so, okay, so this is sort of, so, so in particular, these systems conserve dipole moment, um, but they actually do something much stronger, which is they only allow the dipoles to move, you know, perpendicular to this direction of their, of their dipole moment. Okay. Now to, to talk about anomalies and, you know, again, cause these are sort of to hoft anomalies, um, we're gonna know how to, we're gonna need to know how to gauge the symmetry or more specifically how to, you know, sort of talk about the, the classical background gauge fields that we wanna think about if we wanna talk about these response actions. Okay. Um, and there's a natural way to gauge these subsystem symmetries, which is different from the way that we gauge ordinary global uh, symmetries. Um, and so let me show you concretely what that is when um, in, in the examples that I'm going to talk about. So um, I'm going to have two gauge fields in my two dimensional system, a naught and a x y. Okay. And if I think about sort of doing this on the lattice, A naught is associated with sites and AXY is gonna be associated with the centers of plaquettes, okay? And so under gauge transformation, so A naught, you know, if you like couples to, a, to the, the gauge parameter associated with phase rotation at this site. And so it, gauged, it transforms like under gauge transformations as DT alpha, okay? Um, but AXY, you know, normally if I had a global symmetry, I would put the gauge field on this link, right? And it would, it would couple to, you know, alpha here, minus alpha here, okay? But AXY, um, by putting it in the middle of the plaquette, um, it couples to, to the, the gauge parameters on all four of these sites and in a continuum sort of limit, that means that AXY under gauge transformations uh, transforms as two derivatives, these two derivatives of the gauge parameter alpha. Um, and so, so why is this the right way to gauge a subsystem symmetry? Um, <clears throat> well, one way to answer that question is to, to ask, well, what is the associated current conservation law? Okay. So, you know, these gauge transformations, if we couple these, if we couple A0 to J0, which I'm calling rho or a density and AXY to some current, which we call JXY, then you know, invariance under these transformations implies that the, the current conservation law looks like this, okay? But this current conservation law actually implies that the charge is conserved along any line in X and Y, okay? Um, and that's, oops, that's just because, you know, if you sort of integrate this, both sides of this equation, say along X, we still get um, something that's a total derivative. Um, and so this general picture is the correct way to think about gauging subsystem symmetry, um, either if we have lines in two dimensions or the other example I'll talk about is when I have planes in three dimensions, okay? And these fields are, are generally referred to as symmetric tensor gauge fields or, you know, rank two tensors, it's symmetric rank two tensor gauge fields. Okay. So, Let's talk about anomalies in theories with subsystem symmetry. Um, so, you know, as I said, it would be wonderful to say, oh, you know, we have a complete, um, you know, picture of all of the kinds of anomalies um, that are possible. But, but um, that would be going a little far, a, a little farther than than um, what I can accurately claim. However, we do have some interesting analogs of anomalies that are sort of familiar from um, um, from ordinary global symmetries. And um, so what I'm gonna tell you about is a couple of analogs of familiar anomalies, um, and also how we put those um, at, the, at the boundaries of higher dimensional bulks to see some anomaly inflow. Okay, so the first example of this kind of bulk boundary and anomaly inflow mechanism that I'm gonna tell you about um, is actually a higher rank analog of the, of the theta term. And to make this analogy most precise, um, so the, um, this is most, the, the term that I'm gonna tell you about is most analogous, not to the theta term relevant in four space-time dimensions, but actually to the theta term relevant in two space-time dimensions, okay? Which just looks like this, theta EX. And again, theta is periodic modulo two pi. And so with time reversal symmetry, I have to have theta is equal to either zero or pi. And um, 
you know, so just like in three dimensions, this action, okay, this classical response action is a total derivative in the bulk. Um, but what it predicts is a boundary sort of polarization charge um, at the edges of this of this system, okay? And um, that charge is basically uh, a half integer per unit cell um, when theta is pi and, and, and then, you know, an integer per unit cell when, when theta is zero, so in the trivial case. Um, and this is something that in fact, you know, a model that does this was written, written down a very long time ago. Um, it's called the Sushri for Heger model of polyacetylene. So this, you know, sort of model predates um, all of the modern sort of discussion about um, topological insulators. Okay. But the moral of the story is that this kind of one-dimensional theta term basically predicts not a, not a boundary um, Dirac cone, but just, just a boundary sort of zero energy bound state that can hold charge. Okay. So what is the higher rank analog of this? Well, a higher rank um, analog of the, of the theta term um, looks almost exactly the same, except that I have to replace the electric field, the ordinary electric field with a higher rank analog of the electric field. Okay. And so that's, um, you know, this, so, so I'll call that EXY. And what it is, is this particular combination, this gauge invariant combination of derivatives of the two gauge fields, A naught and AXY. Okay. Um, and so once again, um, you can show that this action is compatible with time reversal symmetry when theta is equal to zero or pi. Okay, so theta is periodic um, in these higher rank gauge theories. Um, good. And now we can ask, okay, so so what? Um, so you know, and again, obviously this is a total derivative. So what it's telling us about is something you know that happens really only on the boundary of the system. Okay. Um, and so, at, so, so in particular, what it's telling us about is a, is a charge or polarization at the boundary of the system. Okay, so if I take this action um, and I'm implicitly coupling these gauge fields to currents and I look at the charge density, um, I'm gonna get an equation that looks like this. Okay, and so let's go through the terms in this equation one by one. Um, so here's my charge density. Um, and so first I have a, a term Let's first look at this term that, that says there's a contribution to my current um, that depends on the derivative of theta um, along the x direction at some boundary where y is fixed. So I've just written the contribution from the top boundary, but obviously also, you know, if this is a finite square, there's another contribution from the bottom boundary. Okay. And what is this? Well, this is exactly the charge that I would have gotten if I had put sort of a one-dimensional theta term along this, um, along this edge, okay? And so we can think of this term here as telling me that this action describes a one-dimensional polarization in the x direction along the y edge, which is what we, what we call this one-dimensional theta term, okay? Similarly, I have a term that describes a one-dimensional polarization um, in the y direction along this edge at constant x, okay? And then um, this last term, so the last boundary term when I integrate by, by parts just tells me about the value of theta at the corner, okay? And then this dx dy theta we're evaluating in the bulk, okay, because then we've done all the boundary terms. So this just gives me zero. And so what I get is um, basically that I get something that, that has a sort of a half charge at the corner, or in particular, um, you know, when theta is pi, what I get is that, that this, this difference between the polarized, the, the sum of the two polarizations minus this corner charge is a half integer, okay? And so this looks very much, um, you know, these boundary states look very much like what you would expect for a higher order topological insulator. Um, Except, of course, that this, the, these, because we're using this higher rank response theory, this comes from a model that has subsystem symmetry. And indeed, we can write down, um, you know, they're sort of contrived, but we can write down, you know, Hamiltonian models on the lattice that exhibit exactly this behavior. Um, so this, the symmetry 
is a U1 symmetry. We think of it as associated with spin rather than charge, okay? Um, and on a corner, we can see that we have a leftover, you know, half spin, um, which is kind of the analog of having a leftover half charge. Okay. Um, so that's the first example, right? So the kind of, so as I said, um, I'm not gonna go up to sort of five space time dimensions because we don't um, sort of know how to connect that to real material systems um, um, re really, but, um, but the kind of closest analog of a topological insulator that we uh, can make in these higher rank uh, systems is this, uh, this higher rank theta term, okay? And it, this comes from a model with subsystem symmetry, but we see that the phenomena that we get, um, the kinds of corner modes that we get are the same in this case as what you would, as what you expect for these higher order topological insulators, which is these zero energy sort of half charge states at the corners of the system. Okay. Now the second example, um, is, an, is a higher rank analog of this axial anomaly that, that, I, that I talked about. Um, and so remember for the axial anomaly, I started with dt phi all squared uh, minus dx phi all squared, okay? So in this case, um, because we want this subsystem symmetry, um, <clears throat> we're gonna go up a dimension and I'm gonna consider the action dt phi squared minus dx dy phi squared, okay? Um, and this is a this is an interesting model that's been studied in a in a variety of contexts. Um, one of its peculiarities is so, you know, this is a, it's a free boson in two dimensions, okay? But it does have this rather unusual dispersion, um, and in particular, the you know, if you look at sort of the the energy, the zero energy, um, sur you know, surfaces sort of are, are are along these intersecting lines in two dimensions, okay? Now you can check that this has subsystem symmetry because you can check directly that because I'm taking two derivatives of phi, okay, if I shift phi by any function of x, you know, plus any other function of y, this action doesn't change, okay? So this obviously has, has a U1 um, subsystem symmetry in two dimensions. Okay. Um, and you have to be a little careful with this, this theory in the sense that, um, you know, one of its peculiarities is that because you have these lines and these lines are going up forever, um, you know, if you try to sort of do any perturbative stuff and impose a cutoff, you have to be really careful because an energy cutoff is most definitely not the same as a momentum cutoff because of this unusual geometry, um, you know, of this kind of zero energy surface here. Okay. So um, this model, just like our, our one-dimensional sort of scalar field theory, has two conserved currents, right? Um, the first one has, has, a, has a J naught, which is proportional to dx dy phi, okay? And jxy, which is proportional to dt phi. And this is the one that's always conserved, right? Just because of equality of mixed partial derivatives on phi, okay? And there's a second current, right? Whose density is associated with dt phi, um, and whose spatial part is associated with dx dy phi. And this one is again conserved due to the equations of motion. Okay. Um, and so just like in our um, axial anomaly in one plus one dimension, um, the second current, okay, like, so, so you know, if I tried to, 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 the second current is not conserved once we gauge the first field. So there's this mixed anomaly, okay because if we add a gauge field uh, for, for the, that, that couples to this first jxy, okay? We actually modify the equations of motion, okay? And again, we find that, okay, this second current is no longer conserved. The equations of motion get modified and it fails to be conserved by this amount that's proportional to exy, okay? So again, this is exactly analogous to an axial anomaly applying this higher rank electric field is gonna break the current conservation of this second sort of axial, if you will, current. Okay. Now, here's a sort of cartoon interpretation of this that, you know, if you like, you can think of subsystem symmetry as, you know, basically restricting, um, restricting 
us to a model of dipoles, okay, mobile di dipoles that can only move in a direction perpendicular to their dipole moment. Um, and so there's two sort of equivalent cartoon interpretations of what's going on here. Um, so basically I have, you know, right moving, I could think about right moving dipoles where the dipole moment is oriented in Y and left moving dipoles where the dipole moment is oriented in Y, right? And then this starts to look very much like a one dimensional axial anomaly of these dipoles. But at the same time, there's a completely equivalent picture, which is I could have, you know, upward moving dipoles with the dipole moment oriented in X and downward moving dipoles with a dipole moment in X, okay? But, you know, somehow cartoon wise, um, this is exactly similar to the axial anomaly. And when I apply this electric, um, this higher rank electric field, I'm sort of gonna tilt the surface of zero energy and some of these left movers are gonna become right movers um, in, in, in either case. And, um, you know, one, one thing about this, uh, uh, this higher rank electric field is it necessarily, you know, is, um, is symmetric under interchanging X and Y. And so we always have these two tilts being, um, being sort of related by being the same. Okay, and so this is the anomaly. Um, and just like for the 1D axial anomaly, we can write down a bulk theory that, um, that cancels this anomaly, okay? Um, and so this is um, a higher rank analog of a mutual Trent-Simons theory, okay? Um, <clears throat> so now the, the so, so, okay. So I should say something about this two-dimensional bulk. So I've introduced fields BXY, BZ, and B0, okay, associated with this, um, you know, which couple to this anomalous current, okay? And I've got AZ, A0, and AXY, okay? And so these fields have the following symmetry. So because we have these, you know, DX and DY acting, okay, what you find is that this is a, this is a symmetry um, where I have U1 rotation uh, for either field along lines in the X direction and lines in the Y direction on the surface. So that's important. We have to mac match our surface subsystem symmetry. But when I extend them into the bulk, I have planes in X, Z, and Y, Z. Okay, so these two families of planes. Um, the subsystem symmetry is not, there's no planes in X, Y. Okay, so I've sort of broken the three-dimensional rotation um, of my system. But that's fine because all we were interested in in this case was canceling the anomaly um, on the bulk. And so I just have to match this subsystem symmetry, sorry, the, the anomaly at the boundary. And so I just have to match this subsystem symmetry at the boundary. Okay. Um, and so you can see that this is BXY times the rank one electric field. This is BZ times, you know, this rank two electric field, EXY. Um, and then B naught times this sort of funny magnetic flux. So a mutual Trent-Simons term, okay? And just like um, what happened in lower dimensions, you can see, right, if we perform a gauge transformation uh, of this, of this in this B field, that this action is gauge invariant only up to a boundary term, okay? And similarly, the, you know, the boundary action in the presence of A fields is gonna be you know, gauge invariant only up to a boundary term, okay? And these terms, sorry, the, the, the boundary action is gonna be, um, is, is not gauge invariant, sorry. Um, and, and so this boundary term from the bulk action actually exactly cancels the anomaly at the boundary. Um, and so what we have is some you know, analog of a subsystem sort of symmetry protected topological phase in as much as if we could, you know, find a material where we had these two symmetries and they were sort of natural, we would have these protected um, gapless boundary modes because of this uh, because of this anomaly inflow argument. Now, of course, um, it's quite hard to imagine a physical system with subsystem symmetry, uh, and so um, <clears throat> uh, it's hard to sort of directly take this theory and plug it as being relevant to understanding materials. However, um, something that amused me greatly is that in fact, this kind of anomaly does have an analog um, in systems of non-interacting fermions and in a, a type of material called a vile semi-metal, which we most definitely do um, know how to realize experimentally. So let me um, just kind of my, the last point I wanna make is, is to show you how that connection is made, 
So let me start in two dimensions. And again, let's, let me imagine that I have a model of, of, of free fermions, okay? And this is sort of a picture. So this, this sort of blue sheet is the Fermi C, okay? And this is a picture of the, of the single particle eigenstates and states that are you know, below the surface of this Fermi C are gonna be occupied and states that are above are gonna be empty, okay? And these lines uh, represent what we call the Fermi surface, okay? So my Hamiltonian you know, basically just looks like two derivatives of some fermion field. Okay, um, and you know this system naively, if I don't apply any fields, uh, conserves the electric charge, and it also conserves momentum in the x and y directions. Okay, um, now this looks like you know three symmetries, whereas before we had two. But if I impose some kind of reflection symmetry, I could think about these two momentum conservation symmetries as being um, related. So now I have this, this funny Fermi surface. And so let me sort of um, emphasize, so we can see here, you know, the blue regions are, you know, going from filled to empty um, and, and then, and, and, and similarly on this side. And so you can see that for positive KX, I have, you know, particles that are, you know, sort of moving, um, um, we call them right movers in KY. And for negative KX, I have left movers in KY, okay. Um, and so that's what this picture here is drawing. So um, again, positive KX, I have these right movers in, in Y, negative KX, I have these left movers in Y. And so now we can ask, well, what happens if I apply an electric field in the Y direction, okay? Um, and basically, so what's gonna happen is I'm gonna create particles, you know, so here's the right movers in Y, I'm gonna gain right movers in Y, and I'm gonna lose left movers in Y, right? And so what's gonna happen is I'm gonna, I'm gonna create particles at KX and destroy particles at minus KX, okay? So the total charge is conserved um, 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 here, there's no net chirality, but the momentum when I apply this electric field in Y, the momentum in X is not conserved, okay? Um, and so this is, you know, again, it's got kind of the same Fermi surface and it's got the same nature of a mixed anomaly um, associated with one symmetry that's, you know, sort of a momentum symmetry in this case, and one symmetry that's the, the one charge con conservation symmetry. And now we can ask, well, uh, you know, okay, so, so imagine this is a surface of theory of free fermions. Um, now, obviously, um, uh, so, and then we can ask what, you know, what kind of bulk can cancel this anomaly, okay? Um, now, one point is that, you know, in, in a, if, if I had a sort of two-dimensional lattice system, um, you know, this, this picture is strange in a number of ways. And one of the ways that it's strange is we have a Fermi surface that's not closed, okay? Uh, hi, Fiona. I don't want to interrupt, yeah. but you're getting close, really close yeah. to the end point, I hope. Excellent. Okay, yeah. And I, I, I will finish in just a sec. And so, yeah, let me just say, so this, this is actually a surface state of a, of a kind of material called a vial semi-metal, which actually has um, sort of vial cones, okay? So vial fermions at four points in the bulk um, and has a, has a special sort of where these vial points are arranged in a sort of quadrupolar pattern. And then, yeah, so I can actually finish there. Um, and so this is just kind of the summary that, you know, um, in classifying phases of matter, anomalies are a really interesting way to kind of think about and frame these, these different um, phases. And that, you know, I think it's um, exciting that in extending these symmetries from ordinary global symmetries to, you know, subsystem symmetries and, and you know, other sort of variants on ordinary global symmetries, we actually can make these connections back to experimental.